We're live. Oh, that one. Hey guys, just starting up the show. <coughs> we improved the show just a little bit by putting gold on the side here. Okay. <laughs> we actually have a TV. One day, Slim will show, and it'll be up here. Yeah. Okay. Are you live on there? Yeah. Well, kind of. Are you ready? Hey, thank you for watching and listening to the Ultra Perform Show, the show about performing your best. We bring you speakers and experts from around the world to share what they find out, the things that they've learned over the years through writing their books, through speaking on TED Talks, right? Yes. To whatever. And today we have a special guest, Lance Allred. He has been a TEDx speaker, and he's going to be talking to us about his journey on uh, becoming a TEDx speaker and what that took. He was sharing that a little bit with me uh, before we started, and uh, he said it took 500 hours to get ready for his speech. Yeah, it, it was a bit, and we were, we were kind of joking that I approached it like, kind of like how I shop at a grocery store. Like, when I first started, I had over 5,000 words, and the average speaker only speaks about 150 words a minute. And so if you do the math, TED Talks have to be below 18 minutes long. And at first, I had no idea really what I was getting into, mm -hmm. because from my application to what the end product became, it looked entirely different from where I thought it was gonna go. And so what I tell people too, my experience and what I do when I work with people, I tell them that TEDx talk is actually a journey of self-discovery if you wish it to be. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that just want to get a TEDx talk to put another notch on their resume. But for me, I wanted mine to actually count because that kind of platform and you only have 18 minutes max to make an impact. Mm -hmm. I want That's to make sure because I've seen a few of them. I'm like, wow, you can see that there's a bit of a system in there. Mm -hmm. But some of them are just like, and you, they'll get repeated and viral and they'll yes. be shared. Yeah. And they bring up a good point in that as I was doing my research and finding what makes a lasting TED Talk is I came up with a combination, and it's something I use as a public corporate speaker as well, is a trifecta called the head, heart, and soul. Meaning, all right. Most TED speakers come out with two of the three. So ahead, they come out with a lot of stats mm -hmm. and data. Mm -hmm. And those can actually become really dry. Because stats don't inspire people. Mm -hmm. But they do kind of give you a background for uh, credibility. Yeah, to say credibility is say. huge. Yeah, you can mention a stat yeah. and then... Support what you're trying to say. Yeah. But some people rely so much on a stat that they're like, they sound like a dry college professor speaking from a podium just reading a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. That doesn't inspire people. No, no. Then you have the heart that people are like maybe funny and engaging. And you have some TED Talks that are just comedic relief. That's, that's fun, but they don't really last. But then you have people that are really excited to be there, um, really passionate about it. Normally you see the combination of head and heart. And those are, those are solid talks. Yeah. But what I found, the third one and the most crucial one, was soul. When people choose to actually embed themselves into the content. So it's one thing for me to come out with data and be excited about it and kind of lecture you and mm -hmm. preach to you. But if I don't actually show my journey through this experience and why it's so important to me mm -hmm. and be vulnerable, and that's the thing too, we have to be very clear. There's a fine line between being vulnerable and oversharing. Mm -hmm. You get some people that just like way too much information, being a victim, and social media has that problem too. Everyone is either putting their best foot forward all the time, mm -hmm. that we can't connect with them, and then we have those other friends that are just like armchair psychology all day, every day. They're just dumping all their problems on the world. Yeah. And you want to find a way that, how am I going to be vulnerable and not be a victim? How am I going to let people know that I'm actually human? Mm -hmm. And so the combination of head, heart, and soul is the one thing that's kind of what I came up with. I'm like, you know what? I ask myself every night, okay, do I still have the head? Do I have information, insight that people don't have? Heart, am I funny? Am I engaging? Am I present? Am I in my body? Because a lot of times people, they will have their TED Talk memorized, 
in the short-term memory spot. Mm -hmm. And when they do that, it sounds like you're reading out loud. You want to, and here's what I did, you want to find a way that it gets embedded into your subconscious. And so what I did when I first started out, again, like I was shopping, I would record a script. I have these headphones that work with my hearing aids that and then I would listen back and I'm like, oh, I'm getting bored. And then you start taking it out, taking it out. But over time, even when you're editing and you're listening to it back, mm -hmm. you're getting embedded into your subconscious. And so that when the final product comes, you know it so well that I can tell anyone on my deathbed, 60 years from now, I'll be able to recite my TEDx talk, What Is Your Polygamy? Really? It's that deeply embedded. Mm -hmm. And so that's all total editing, redrafting, going back, listening, and just feeling it. And that's where the soul comes in. And that the words at the end, when I finally stepped onto the stage after at least 500 hours of practice and preparation, the words just became a vessel, a catalyst, really, for the emotion of what I really wanted to express. Mm -hmm. And that's where it kind of caught me by surprise, the journey of self-discovery. When I first sent in the application, and we had to talk about application too if you have time, you have application has to pop. And people, I mean, there's lots of tricks I have learned that really makes an application pop. Yeah, you have to tell me because I've actually, okay. I've actually gone on there and okay. mentioned that earlier. And I've had friends go on there too to, mm -hmm. uh, what's it called? To, uh, uh, open submission, open form. Yeah, yeah. no, no, they, uh, they suggest me to. Oh, yeah, yeah. On, you know. they suggest you. Um, you I have to. They have a term for it. But never okay. underestimate the power of a question mm. in an application. Mm. Flip it back on them. Really? Don't say, I'm awesome, this is what I'm going to talk about. Ask them a question. Mm. That's one of the first things I do to make an application pop. Um, so, my first thing was like, we always t talk about what it's like for a girl growing up in polygamy. But we're horrified of these girls being shipped around and tossed around like objects. But we don't really, really pay attention to what it's like for a young boy growing up in polygamy. Mm. So I at first thought it was just going to be me giving people insight in what it's like for a boy growing up in polygamy. Especially in Utah with the word polygamy being like a Voldemort word. We don't like to talk about it. You know, what? we don't, yeah, it's like, Is no. that what you call it, Voldemort? <laughs> yeah, the Voldemort. Is yeah. Oh, name? Yeah, no. Yeah, we don't want to talk about it. That's, we, we want our perfect history of Mormonism mm -hmm. go away. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually, as I began to ask a question, what is your polygamy? The soul came in. I can't just be some preachy guy speaking all Zen guru stuff, being enlightened, if the people that I'm speaking to do not know or don't believe that I've actually walked the talk myself, mm -hmm. if I've actually paid a price. Because social media and everything, we have enough gurus out there that anyone can regurgitate Wayne Dyer and just flip around the syntax of a mm -hmm. sentence and oh, sound yeah. enlightened. I, know. Right? I call it, yeah, I call it, don't, you can't live your life by a speaker's sound bite. Exactly. You can't. Like, they sound great, but... Try exactly. applying that to your life. Exactly. And that's that's a huge thing that I've learned too, is that we're getting better and better as a people. Of when someone goes on a stage, if you can actually feel that they've paid a price, mm -hmm. they've actually walked through something, versus someone that again has all the perfect sound bites and knows how to say all the right things and do a perfect PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. We can feel if they're really there or not. Yeah. And so me not wanting to fall into that category of just being someone else, another speaker that knows how to have savviness on a stage and sound really good. I'm like, no, I need to go a little bit deeper. And thank goodness for my um, selection committee and my speaking coaches too, is they knew there was something more too. They kept sending me back, sending me back with another track. No, we don't like this. There's something more there. And eventually what it became was me learning how to go through the grieving cycle. Uh, the loss of a marriage. Mm -hmm. Me realizing my polygamy was this deeply, again, embedded baggage that I had brought with me. Even after, after I escaped, I still had these subconscious patterns and knee-jerk reactions and tendencies that I finally had to stare cold hard into the mirror and own my part of a failed marriage mm -hmm. and see how my own baggage from polygamy sabotaged it. How, how resistant were you to seeing that? 
How long did it take you? It was hard. So I would say I worked after I was selected in April. After about three months of work, it wasn't until the, the final month, 30 days before TEDx Salt Lake mm -hmm. City, that I finally chose to go there. And it was hard and it was scary. But here's the thing that I learned about vulnerability. When you choose to become vulnerable, you actually become bulletproof. When you own it mm -hmm. and you own your story. It's kind of like my uncle. I, I don't want to throw him under the bus, but he was my uncle who taught me. He, he would tell me Helen Keller jokes as a kid with my hearing loss. Not that that's politically correct, but he taught me to be able to laugh at myself. Mm -hmm. So when the bogeys came or whatever, tried to make fun of my speech impediment at the time as a kid or whatnot, if you can laugh at yourself, people can't hurt you. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you finally own your story and you own your baggage, that allows you to finally come to a place of acceptance, which is a stage of the grieving cycle. And then you're able to move on and make the best informed decision to move on with your life. That's part of grieving. And where I came from in polygamy, we didn't grieve because it was, oh, well, we're God's chosen people. If someone died, we'll see them again in heaven. Mm -hmm. So grieving was viewed as a sign of weakness or a lack of faith. A lack of faith. And not believing and not exactly. trusting in the, the faith itself. And so I didn't know how to grieve. So I had to, as a 35-year-old man, learn how to actually grieve. Mm -hmm. And that's what the TEDx taught, really forced me and challenged me to do. But you you mentioned earlier you escaped, is that how you see it? Um, so when I was 13, we actually had to go into hiding. My father blew the whistle on abuse and uh, other things. He was, everyone expected him to be the heir apparent to the all great group. And all my cousins had been my best friends. And then suddenly government officials got involved and we had to go mm -hmm. just like that clean and so it was a it was a pretty traumatic experience but at that same time I grew from 5'10 to 6'4 that year in 8th grade and that's when I started playing basketball and so 5'10 in height and then 6'4 six, six, four. 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 yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was a good segue for me to learn I was able to transition from that loss but to the point again, because I was able to focus on something like basketball, I didn't have to grieve. Mm -hmm. I just put all of my attention in the basketball. Oh, so you worked it out that way. Worked it out. Mm -hmm. I distracted myself with a different coping mechanism. So mm -hmm. I have always been able to channel these anxieties and OCD tendencies that I have been diagnosed with over the years, especially in my teen years. I channeled it into basketball, and my way of coping was socially acceptable because I, uh, I dove into sports and athletics. And you were good at it. It was my passion, right? Yeah. But I'll admit that I actually, I was a junkie in that I, w I would work out so hard because I had all these weird thoughts growing up in polygamy that I would make myself vomit every morning before school because I worked out so hard and then my brain would shut off because endorphins would kick in. Hmm. That was my junkie rush, but mine was socially acceptable. And so therefore, a lot of emotional uh, stuntedness, um, refusal to uh, develop or address hard issues. But again, I was just a kid. And my parents, as much as I love them, it's not like they had the best standards of coping skills either. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's crazy how much we learn as kids and we try to apply that. Yes. Like the sound bites to daily adult life. Yeah. Right? Because when I left high school, I was clear. Everything was black and white. Things are easy. Why are people having such a hard time doing it? <laughs> oh, crap. Yeah. You have to deal with people. Yes. That's what the problem is, right? Oh, you have yeah. to deal with their, their feelings and their opinions. And I'm not like, I'm not like saying it's, well, I'm kind of saying it's bad. But it's just what you have to deal with, right? Yes. And you have to deal with all these different, and, and yourself. Yeah. Stuff you didn't even know you were going to do. And you're like, why did I do that? Mm -hmm. What's going on? Then you have to retrace it, break it down. Yes. If you're committed to the growth. Exactly. But that's the thing is, um, especially with my background in polygamy and Mormonism, it's so intellectually satisfying because you can clearly see tangible benchmarks you have to get to. Mm -hmm. But what you're talking about is how I define emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. which is self-reflection and accountability. Mm -hmm. 
but there's no real set criteria if you can measure, am I emotionally healthy or not? I wish there was a class. I mean, yeah, there would be great. Right? Yeah. A class of uh, the, how to deal with emotions and people, mm -hmm. yeah. like your relationships, all right. of that, and money. Yes. <laughs> Back. In Back. school. <laughs> and that is surprising they don't teach us money and financial. Uh, I remember learning yeah. how to write a check. Balance a checkbook. Congratulations. Check in a young that's age, it. too. Yeah. Young age. Yeah. That's, that's all I remember. The yeah. size of classes I took in mm -hmm. college or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. It's, yeah. Like a, it's like you said, emotional responsibility associated to money. Yeah. It would be huge because you true. could watch the emotional decisions that you make. Yes, very much so. Very so true. Bye, Linda. Bye. Yeah, no. um, so there's, there's so many things that... I love to teach and coach people because when people come to me and they have a great story, what I love to do and what I'm really good at doing is actually, okay, how are we going to make your story generalizable for everybody else? And here's where some practical things I've learned that there are dozens of TEDx venues around the country that, and I'm going to use the word desperate, they are desperately looking for content. Because they look for sponsors. They have, they have sponsors and endorsements of people who are paying money. They need to make sure that the content they put on the stage is good. Mm. So people keep coming back and buying tickets. Yeah, sure. So there's dozens. It's a machine of, still. Exactly. And so, yes, there are, everyone thinks to be selected, you just randomly selected. That's the case for a lot of them. But there are a lot of other ones as well that have what's called open call, open curation, mm -hmm. open submission. And so you want to, you can't just shotgun strategy either. And I'll tell people, I was rejected three times by different TEDx venues before TEDx Salt Lake City accepted me. Well, how do you, so when I went to this site, there was just one site. How do you, how so do there's you TEDx Salt Lake City, but you find, so you get on Google and you look at, okay, oh, so you, TEDx you, venues. Uh, I just and, went straight to TEDx. Yeah, but there's dozens. No, you want to, you get on Google, you look at TEDx venues, mm -hmm. like open call, open submission, you Google that. Then... You have to first focus on connecting with the micro. Everyone thinks, oh, my talk's amazing. It's going to do well to, on the general audience online. Maybe so. But you have to first make sure that the idea you're sharing connects with the local audience. And so my topic of polygamy, again, in Salt Lake City is a hot word. Mm -hmm. If I try to submit it to TEDx Detroit. Like, that doesn't really apply to the local audience. So, like, let's say you're passionate jazz music. I'm like, right, find something in Memphis or TEDx New Orleans. Because you want to have a talk that's going to get the immediate local audience mm -hmm. engaged with you, interacting with you in that live moment. Because when that energy is there and it's recorded, it will transcend and it will carry through on the online presentation. Mm -hmm. And people will feel that, and that's yeah. contagious. Yeah. So you want to first focus on, okay, micro. Where is the immediate local audience best going to respond to my idea mm -hmm. we're sharing? It can't, you can't just broad stroke it. you got to really sit down, okay, you know what, this topic applies to this, these different parts of the country. And then the real trick is when you can make it hit the micro, but also have that idea that's hitting the micro transcend and also be generalizable to the macro. That's another combination that I found. I watch a lot of them. Like that's, I guess, I guess that's why it makes sense for the local audience there. But then I watch other ones that are kind of good for a broad audience. But I'm like thinking, you can feel that the local audience isn't really engaged with their content because it doesn't really apply mm -hmm. to them. But there's always, you have to also think about title, just like the cover of a book is so important. And if you if you see these patterns on TEDx. When people have words like sex, masturbation, adultery, they always have a bunch of views mm -hmm. because sex is transcendent and people are fascinated mm -hmm. with it. But me too, the word polygamy, again, at the micro, but also on the macro, Oprah, national coverage of Warren Jess, people are fascinated with the word. Yeah, yeah. But the syntax, the improper syntax of what is your polygamy, like a Jeopardy question, people are like, what is this? Is that, yeah, it's rhetorical, but what's he getting? It's at? intriguing for sure. Exactly. Like, when I read it, I was like, huh? Yeah. I didn't read it. Like, yeah. I had to reread the description and go back. And then people will click on it. I was like, oh. Those are all sorts of little practical things that I coach people on and I help them find and research a venue. 
But the real thing is, and I ask them, what's more important, the views or impact? Mm. Some people say, hey, you know, I just want to roll it in my camp because okay, I get it. I'm not judging them. They want to have a look good on their resume. But impact is, is your idea really going to help someone else? Mm. Is it going to give them information but also help them grow? Again, emotional intelligence, be able to have permission or courage to go do some self-reflection themselves. Those are what I love to get at. And so again, for me, what I found, why I fell in love with TEDx, um, if people choose to be, it's an incredibly cathartic process where people actually get to take experiences in their lives and make them teaching points. Mm. And so you find value in your struggles. And when you own it and you transcend it and you help other people learn from that. That's... That's what I love to do, and that's what I tell people. It, it, TEDx can be more than just a fun little seven-minute public service announcement. So what happened uh, after you did your TEDx? After what I did TEDx, the results and, 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 experience personally and business. Oh boy, um, the personal growth is what has set me on. It helped me become a better father. Mm -hmm. I was a single father. I retired from basketball because I was going through a divorce and. I figure people always ask me to come speak to kids at schools because I have a wacky story and there's got to be a way that I can actually monetize this. And I realize there's a lot of speakers, again, to the point you were making earlier, a lot of speakers making stupid money that don't really have a story, but they're just really smooth and savvy. And I'm like, well, I got a wacky story. As far as death delivering this kids making the NBA, I've sort of cornered that market. And so there's got to be a way I can make it work. But I kept getting pigeonholed as an athlete. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, we already had an athlete come last year and talk to our company. I'm like, well, I'm not, yes, but I'm not really an athlete. I mean, I didn't play till I was 13. I was a leader and a writer. I was a Dungeons and Dragons kid growing up. Um, Me too, actually. But then I realized that I liked women more. <laughs> I started no, the trick is finding a woman that will play Dungeons and Dragons with you. She'd play a little bit, but she'd get bored. Okay. But uh, it was like either, it was either play with the guys or hang out with my girlfriend. <laughs> and they were so mad at me, I remember. But now that I'm older, I'm like, oh, okay, that's actually a not bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> and so I knew, I knew I knew I needed a TEDx talk to show all these people that were giving me like rejections, hey, you know what, I'm gonna give them a full end-to-end -end presentation product in 13 minutes. Mm. And they can see what I do, what I'm about. 13 minutes. So a TEDx for me allowed me to transcend. It was 13 minutes? 13 minutes. TEDx? Yeah. That's all it was. 13 minutes. Wow. And 500 hours for 13 minutes. Yeah, 13 minutes again, it's, you have to realize too, when you're speaking from a stage, less is more. Mm -hmm. You want to let people have time to actually learn about themselves. It's not my job as a public speaker to have people know about me. Mm -hmm. It's to help them through my experiences, drawing parallels with them to help them reflect and learn about themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the TEDx talk did for me. And since then, yeah, it's allowed me to speak to American Express, Costco, Coldwell Banker, the Federal FBI, Bureau, yeah. and FBI. Um, it's been, so you, it's been huge. You've spoken to them and they, uh, I forgot to tell you another thing before, but they pay you? They do well. So on average, the last, like when I speak to corporates like that, you're looking at anywhere between ten and $15,000 in appearance. To speak to them? Yeah. But it's not the same talking point. No, no, they say, no. So, well, you talk about this. Yes. So what I do too, everyone loves to kind of hear my journey and the wacky story. I didn't make the MBA until I was 27. Mm -hmm. so that's seven years longer than the average rookie. So I always go and touch on perseverance. 27. Great. Yeah. Wow. So I touch on perseverance and grit. Um, but I also find out what are their pain points. Mm -hmm. They tell me, this is what we're struggling with. I'm like, oh, I got a basketball story for that. I got a sports metaphor for that. Because everyone loves the power of a sports metaphor. Mm -hmm. And so I understand I am very fortunate. But also, corporate sports world is the corporate world. Everyone thinks it's all pure merit. No, it's very corporate, very political. So I'm able to take all these parallels, again, but with a sports metaphor, and drive home um, applicable solutions and resolutions and action points that help them really 
resolve a lot of their pain points in their corporation, mm. but also leave an impact that I'm not a rah-rah speaker. Again, like with what is your me, I get people to really ground and be reflective. Well, I, I think you're it doing it now, and the whole point I've been talking to since yeah. before we started the show. Yeah, your 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 words are impactful. The way Thank you're you. speaking it, and the way I appreciate. We that. want to listen to you. I don't know what the views are, or listeners, but it's um, like you're, it's engaging, very engaging. Thank you. Um, you know, being in speech therapy till I was 16, the ability to communicate is the thing I'm most grateful for. Mm. And so when I go to speak on a stage, it's actually a very spiritual experience for me. Um, and so you'll never see me selling products from the stage. I'm not that type of speaker. I'm not going to promote my books or whatnot. My job is there to actually to communicate and connect with people. Mm -hmm. And it's what I love to do. And it's an incredible career, if you want to call it that, being able to take these experiences and utilize them and help other people along the way. And I couldn't ask for a better career. It's, it's, it's far more, I don't miss basketball because I still get the pregame butterflies before I go on the stage. Mm -hmm. But I actually get to connect with people on a deeper level now. Yeah, it, var it varies for me. I've noticed that sometimes I'm not nervous at all. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get nervous. I'm like, what is that? Yeah. Sometimes I notice like a different emotion. Yeah. Right? Like uh, when Salento's here, I notice I got angry at her. And she doesn't know. <laughs> I she might watch this because she yeah. transcribes these. Uh -huh. But I'm like, why? It was me. I knew it was me. Right. I'm like, why am I angry at her? Mm -hmm. There's no reason. It's something yeah. within myself. Yes. I just need to get over it because it's ridiculous. I'm like, what am I stressed about? It is, it's so funny, too. You it was just a flare. That I it's noticed. a flare. I and didn't give it to her, but, but that's, yeah. that's self-reflection and introspection. It's one thing, many things I've learned. I played basketball for 10 years around the world in various cultures and continents. Things transcend. You're getting at mirrors and projections that I've learned the hard way. But there's great wisdom when kids say, I know you are, but what am I? Mm. Because really, when someone labels you with something, more often than not, that is the very label that they themselves are being terrified of being labeled sure, as. Sure. So if I call you stupid, it's probably me. I'm terrified of someone mm -hmm. calling me stupid. There's a, there's a good part in know, the Peaceful Warrior. Yes. You know, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Really good part yeah, in that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really good parts in that. I used to watch that, The Secret, What the Belief, and something else every mm -hmm. morning. Kind of cycle yes. through them. Yeah. And that's the thing, yes, hey, I, I watched all those, Wayne Dyer, I love reading all those books. There is a point to what you said, reflection and account responsibility and accountability, that sometimes the New Age movement goes a little too far with, oh, path of least resistance, float downstream. Yeah, I know. Uh, I am where I, I feel am. feel exactly the same way, but I know. No, there's still accountability in all things. Mm -hmm. Well, action too. Exactly. Yeah. And so when I tell people, when I talk to people about the, every goal I've written down in my life has come true, doesn't look exactly what I thought it was going to look like. No. But here's the thing is, you can't just wish for a pony and then a pony's going to appear. You set an intention, but then a download comes that says, this is what you have to do exactly. to make yeah. it happen. And then do it. Exactly. I, so, I, I, I share intention. this with people. What I've noticed is this. The more I pursue my creative thought, yes. even though it's hard, yes. like those, those TVs that sit over there, mm -hmm. they're supposed to be up here. Yeah. I haven't put them up yet. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, that's one example. The the seats here. We have seats back here. It's supposed to be a studio audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We haven't pushed it, but we have people come and watch the show now. Okay. But those like whenever I do pursue my creative thought, mm -hmm. my intuition goes up. Exactly. I, I just my intuition just kicks in. I'm like, wow. And that's a lot. That's of interesting. That's a lot of attraction. Mm -hmm. You set an intention. You attract people with the right frequency to help you achieve that intention. And you have it requires action. It requires accountability and responsibility. And so, hey, I love the New Age movement, but it does swing way to the pendulum of people saying, hey, I'm just on my path. I don't have to apologize for anything. I'm just here to experience what I'm doing. No, there's a lot of stuff. Exactly. You know, I, exactly. I did a lot of, you know, landmark education. I know landmark, yeah. I've done a lot of landmark as a course supervisor, and it brought me to this point. But also, I got frustrated because I saw the people. Uh, they would take it, they would be empowered in their life, right? but they couldn't see anything out of their life. Barely. You know it. You know they it. got very, like, and, and I had friends in the landmark, like I said, yeah. it's got me here, for right. sure. But I noticed, like, they 
then stay kind of stuck, not stuck, and then focus on the story. Yes. That my story is this. It's like, okay, well, well, I heard that. Do, Let that go. Let's exactly. go. Exactly. Or do something anyway, or something. It was just like, yeah. you almost chain this. me to them. I noticed that I was doing that too. Yeah. That's... And I became more passive. Mm hmm. And I wasn't able to like do the thing. I don't know. I don't know. No, 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 no. The thing is, this is the whole conversation yeah, that I yeah, have exactly. because I feel the same way. Because even in polygamous groups, those kind of like rising star landmarks, they are very successful in going into polygamous groups and allowing people to make some shifts without really making them see that. You kind of have to make a really big shift sometimes. But sometimes they're able to stay where they are. Oh, the retail yes, story. that's perfect. Yes. So they get people to spill yes. their guts out sometimes, but not really help them put them back in. Well, it's say we're moving. Well, here's the problem. It's a business. Yes. So stay in and do more courses. Yes. You need to do the next course. You need to do the next course. Hey, you don't have any money? Assist. You need helpers. And I'm going to say something that's insightful. And I'm not trying to be bitter or anything like that. But my grandfather, Rulon Allred, he started the Allred Group, the AUB. He was assassinated before I was born, so I never knew him. But in the 50s and 60s, he had this polygamous group. And he became the largest faction the LDS Church had ever seen. He was the biggest threat. He had so much money, too. He was very influential. But he started this model of, I'm going to have my ghostwriters and researchers make books for me so every year I can put out a new book for all my followers. And so we label that a cult, but his business model of self-help books and awareness for all of his followers, that was 20 years before Zig Ziglar, mm -hmm. before Tony Robbins, before the self-help business model really came. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in that world mm -hmm. and I've seen it and I've watched it. And so I see all these other things pop up and I'm like, yeah, I'm familiar with this model. I get it. It's great. I get it. And so, yeah. Um, well, I'd love to. Do you want to go a little longer? Um, um, it's your call, man. I mean, great. Well, I'm going to do this. I haven't done this before. So that's the end of part one of the show with Lance Allred talking about wanting to be a TEDx speaker. Now we're going to start part two. Okay. Um, right. That way we can break it up in okay. two 30 minute slots. All right. Great. Awesome. Um, so tell us about your book. So I have four books, but the latest book is How to Get a Million View TEDx Talk, where, again, it's a how-to with heart. It's not just some dry nonfiction. Um, Chris Anderson's book, Talk Like That, was great. It gave me some insights, but I figured there, I couldn't find a book out there when I was preparing for mine mm -hmm. that actually came from someone who had actually been through the process. And so... I figured, you know, this is a good opportunity for me to do a self-help kind of book as a speaker um, because I get people asking questions all the time, contacting me, and I'm like, it's cheaper for you and my time also if you just buy the book. Mm. Um, and I walk people through all those things and I help them, um, again, I mean, it's always their choice. I mean, how deep do they really want to go? How impactful do they want their talk to be? And so that's my, my fourth one is my real first kind of nonfiction approach because the first two, Long Shot Basketball Gods, they're memoir style. First one was published by Harper Collins in 2009. Very memoir, basketball, my journey from polygamy to sports and everything. Um, but those are kind of like reality um, literature books. This, but this one, How to Get a Million View TEDx Talk is a kind How of- to. How to get the million view TEDx talk. How to get the million view TEDx talk. Yeah. On Amazon. I have it on Audible and Amazon. Mm -hmm. Audiobook as well. And so, yeah. I, I tell people, yeah. If if you just want the practical applications of how to get on stage and make it last and, you know, do a good job, get the book. But then coaching and working with me, it's, it's a different story. We definitely... I get down with people and I, so I have a couple clients that I've been able to work with and really figure out what their subconscious are trying to say. Because mm -hmm. I can hear someone talk and tell me their story, but I'm like, yeah, but your subconscious wants to say something else. Mm -hmm. And I know it does. Sure. And when you get to that 
on your hand, you start peeling away the layers. And that's how I also design what is your polygamy. There's four different layers. Every layer is a segue. I segue it with videos. Mm. Don't use bullet points. Why would someone pay you money to read out loud from bullet points? I, don't, I, see, I see speakers, public speakers, using reading out loud from bullet points. And I'm like, I, I don't get it. But photos and videos are so amazing. You, so when you're doing your talk or talk, yeah. you did the TEDx talk? Or yeah. And I, I've taken so you that flash same the videos? And yeah, flash the videos. And I've taken that approach now as a keynote speaker too. You don't, don't use bullet points. Um, use videos and photos to get people to actually step into your world. And when you use a powerful image, again, it allows people to learn about themselves and they will connect their own memories and their own well, empathy or whatever into the journey that you're taking them on, mm -hmm. whether it's a TEDx stage or a public speaking stage. And so those, gosh, Lots of things, but those ones I would tell anyone, make sure you, again, research the venue and find, you gotta make your application pop, but then be willing to definitely go deep, head, heart, and soul. Those are the combination. And I kind of gave you in this last half hour, a kind of a nutshell of what I cover in about 200 pages in the book, how to get a million to be talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because I have a friend named Audi that really wants me to be a TEDx speaker. Okay. Uh, tell me about his story. Her story. Her Audi. story. Audi. Okay. Uh, like the uh, military famous hero or something. Mm -hmm. she is. But she, uh, she is a dreamer. She's a she interprets dreams. Okay. So for five years, mm -hmm. literally, whenever I have a dream, I do a video of it. Mm -hmm. I'm a video guy. And then I post it to this private site that we have, and then she'll interpret it for me. Mm -hmm. And she writes down every time she goes to bed, she wakes up and she writes the dream for five years in mm -hmm. a book. Okay. In books. She has multiple books. Okay. She sees how powerful uh, dreams are. Yes. And how they, uh, the interpretation of them, and she's really drawn to be a, a Okay, so what? She's even going to school right now just so she could do it professionally and have that as credibility in uh, psychology. So that's what my first one, um, she probably is way ahead of me. You have to, okay, find, you always, in something like that, you have to at least have one, just one, one stat that talks about the power of a dream, whether it's Sigmund Freud or someone else using a stat. Mm. Again, the head. One statistic. One stat. Okay, just one. Just one. Everyone thinks I don't have three or four. Because remember this, people remember what they feel, not what they hear. Mm. You give them one stat, that's it. And they'll say, okay, she has some foundation. Let's see where she's gonna go with this. And then from there, she begins to show, okay, this journey of chronicling the dreams and everything. And that's the heart. And she, doesn't, she doesn't get how Huge that is, and like because mm -hmm. I mean, she's been on the show before. But she's a good friend of mine. I'm like, mm -hmm. You don't get how huge that is. Nobody does this. Yeah. And when I say nobody, nobody. And then that's the heart. She's passionate about that. You can mm -hmm. feel. Oh yeah. So many, so that's the passion. Yeah. But she has to let us know why. Mm -hmm. That's the soul. Like why? What? Why is it why important? Is it so important? Why? To, to her. Why is it so to important her? to her? To her. To her. Mm -hmm. And then once we understand why it's important to her, she can then let us know why it's important to us. That's, that's the job. That's what I do with people. Mm -hmm. I say, okay, we got to get down and figure out why. Is there an experience that you had as a child that this profound dream, it was a prophetic? Was it something that happened? It was a, a post-traumatic dream. We got to figure out what was the the soul, catalyst the catalyst that, that made you start to be doing a thing. this. Yeah. So that's the combination. I don't know if I ever so. asked her that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's what will inspire people to really invest in her. Mm -hmm. Because if she's just telling me all these exciting things about the dreams, like, you know, I still don't know you. I need to know why this is important to you. Sure. She shared a little bit about that mm -hmm. on the show, and it was personal, yeah. but when people saw it, I'll let her share that. She mm -hmm. it too. Yeah. But, uh, 
That brings up something. You mentioned, I think, from the age of 20 to 27, you were trying to be, get an MBA. Could you share about that? Yeah. Is, so, that, is that the right group? Oh, well, yeah. So when yeah. I speak to corporations and nonprofits, they, they love for me to come in and kind of tell my story and inspire them. They all kind of want the story, and I take the pain points as we discussed. But where I have the platform is I couldn't play basketball with my hearing aids in. I had to be very visual, but I got hit a lot. I got knocked down a lot, literally and metaphorically. But it always comes down to choice. And I tell people the essence of leadership is perseverance, and the essence of perseverance is grit. The essence of grit is choice. The word grit's thrown around right now in academia as though it's some abstract concept. Mm -hmm. How do you measure it? Simple choice. Do you choose to get back up every time you get knocked down? There's no magic wand, there's no cheat sheet, there's no essential oils. Oh, I wish there was. I wish there was. I trust me, I wish there was. And so I get to tell people, I didn't make the NBA until I was 27. That's seven years longer than the average rookie. So I had to go play overseas and play in the minor leagues before I finally got my job in the do NBA. Do people do that? Do it's, people do that? Because well, usually what I've heard is just college and then you're... College or they go make a career overseas and kind of play for a few years there. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm definitely one of the oldest in the history of the NBA to make it. And the and first deaf player. Legally deaf, yeah. And legally deaf. Yeah. Legally deaf, 80% hearing loss. And so that platform is what allows me to go speak to corporations and again talk to them about again there is no magic wand we have this illusion of social media now as ironic this is a social media we're on right now mm -hmm. but, but and, and that's five, this this is a good setting i mean this shows the power of social media but mm -hmm. there's always a, a pro and a con and social media has also conditioned people to believe in instant gratification yeah. that they see all these illusions of success and it should happen just like that because we have online websites that say we'll make your shirt exactly customized for you mm -hmm. and then we now have become, become conditioned to think that life should be customized just for me and I create my own reality and there's some truth to that and everything should fit and if it doesn't fit I don't have to learn how to actually negotiate mm -hmm learn how to problem solve and communicate with someone that I have a disagreement with. Mm -hmm. No, I can just ghost them and they're out of my life entirely. Ugh. And that's not I'm really like, That's like a, oh, you're yeah. speaking my language. Because I, I do these videos all the time. Yeah. Not, not just the show, but these quick shot videos. Right. Like on, on social media. Mm -hmm. But I'm always talking about that aspect of yes. it. Yes. But what, what would be great since you mentioned that, because I don't know if I've been able to speak to the cost because mm -hmm. I think people don't see the cost of it, mm -hmm. right? Well, what, yes. What's wrong with that? Well, I, I'm living my life, everything's fine. Well, what are they missing? The cost is, the ironic thing about social media is that we're more lonely than we've ever been. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm able to do what I do now, because everyone's tired, one, of the perfect golden smile speaker coming on the stage, or that corporate HR trainer who comes with the perfect stats and PowerPoint. I just want to feel a connection with somebody. Mm -hmm. And I'm desperately looking for a connection. That's what people want. They want to feel human. And so the cost is we're distracted and our brains are distracted, but our hearts aren't having that real human connection. Mm -hmm. And part of the real growth of human connection is learning to find, again, even with people that have huge differences from you, learning to find, you know what? There's grace in that person mm. that I can connect with. And me traveling all over the world, playing on all these continents, being a team captain on most of these continents with my ability to read body language, if me, the deaf kid, and I don't like putting my hearing aids in every day, it's exhausting, but I've always been pushed out of my comfort zone. And people have to realize we were not born to be caged within our comfort zones. Those are illusions as well. Mm. And... So me being forced outside of my comfort zone has allowed me, one, a high threshold for failure. I've failed so many times again, 27, until I made the NBA. Yeah. So many times it blow people's mind how many times I failed. But you choose to get back up, and with that, you're able to, every now and then, 
find these rare and authentic human connections with people. Mm. And some people that I would have no business being friends with if I hadn't been forced to learn how to communicate and problem solve with them mm. as teammates on a basketball court. And another thing too, uh-huh. when I speak to kids, last year I spoke to over 20,000 uh, kids last year over schools and universities. Mm. People would be shocked when you walk into an NBA locker room you'll watch teammates buy likes and buy followers. Mm. Even NBA players. You're going to be killed for sure. (laughs) No, I won't be killed. But they buy these followers and they buy likes. And so, it's illusions. That bummed me out. (laughs) Don't be bummed out. No, because you work so hard. You work so hard. To do what I do. It should give you permission to realize at least you're trying to do it the right way. Mm. And there's integrity in that. Sure. And there's dignity, mm. knowing that you're really going for human connection here. Yeah. You're not going for illusions. You're not going for numbers. Again, you're going for impact, mm. not user numbers or stats. You're going for human connection. And again, there's grace in that. And that matters. And the people that tune in every day, they feel that. Mm. Because they know that you're going to go for real human connection. Mm-hmm. And so, don't let that bum you out. You realize, if these people who are supposed to be happy and successful what would they be buying? are so worried about making their illusions appear real, yeah. are they really happy? Yeah, sure. No. Sure. No. It, when you get to the NBA and you get to peek behind the curtain of Oz and you see that these are all human beings too. Were you shocked when you saw that? There was disenchantment, I'll admit, when I made the NBA. Because I had a story, again, my polygamy, at the age of five, I had a Sunday school teacher that tell me that God had made me deaf as a form of punishment. And so I had this deeply mm, embedded nice. story for the longest time that I had to do something amazing, mm. like be the first deaf player in the NBA, and then I'd be worthy of love. Mm. God would be proud of me. I had destination addiction, like so many of us do. And there I was shooting a free throw in front of 16,000 people, and I'm like, the winner, or it doesn't matter. Why don't we feel well, you didn't feel it? Oh, no. I feel exactly the same. Because the Hollywood movies, they never show us what happens the day after the happy ending. Mm-hmm. Just triumphant kiss, musical score, the perfect ring. girl, the perfect girl that exactly. will, they'll do any stuff for yeah. everything. I'm, I'm looking for that girl. Like, yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. And you see, I'm they're in, like, "That's okay, I love you." I'm like, "That's yeah. not a real life." And you can beat me. Yeah. And so learning how to be leaders of our own lives, understanding that your self-worth is not attached to an outcome. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest lesson I learned in my travels around the world. It took me climbing these towers of illusions, and then they fell underneath my own weight. And I realized, at the end of the day, it's still just me standing there. And Mm -hmm. having to learn how to detach my self-worth from an outcome. Again, that makes you bulletproof. It makes you unafraid to fail. Mm -hmm. Knowing that if I go and I shoot for this, which I choose to, if I fail, it has no reflection on my value as a human being. But so many of us are afraid to fail, because again, on social media, everything is so quantified with likes and views. If I fail, people will stop following me, they'll stop watching me, and I won't be important anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are all illusions. They're stories of madness that your self-worth is attached to an event, when really, who you are is a beat that you keep through the highs and through the lows. What do you think will happen if we just keep following this trend? Well, it's dying, because I'm telling you right now. Um, because now, even in my own career, I'm getting corporations now coming to me saying, we want you to be more than just a one-day keynote speaker. We actually want you to come in and start working with us, yeah, our yeah, culture, yeah, yeah. our corporate trainer. Mm-hmm. Because, and they'll say, we've had enough people come in mm-hmm. with the perfect stats the and success. The dazzle. Yeah, dazzle. Yeah. We I mean, you have dazzle, but it's it's based on truth, not just, it's not dazzle. Yes. I'm just like 10 minutes. And, uh, yeah, um, just being real with people, mm-hmm. being authentic. Mm-hmm. And just even in my own life, you're finding that, but also, two years ago, if you remember, like Instagram was just pushing this image that, oh, if you have this many followers, this is how much money you can make for an advertisement. Mm-hmm. What's happening? is money's leaving 
social media. Because people realize likes doesn't necessarily quantify into action. No, it doesn't. Here's yeah, what I, doesn't. in my head, when I see Facebook or Instagram, I've tried it myself, you try marketing, it's just people sitting like Al Bundy on Married with Children, with a hand in their pocket, just Going scrolling through. through the phone. Yeah, I do that too. I know. And so likes does not necessarily quantify to anything but ego boost but what does that get you a cookie maybe <laughs> it sometimes does get you a cookie because you can get a sponsor and give you cookies that's true well, you get so many but likes. but that but that is dying it really yeah. is though the money is, it is, it is i said it is, i said like a month or two months ago i posted the social media is a fad it is and what i realized though uh, seeing over time is that when there's a fad, we don't realize it's a fad. Well, that's what because we're in the middle of it. Exactly. Yeah, that's like, right. that's this will never go. Yeah. Baggy pants will never go. Right? <laughs> or whatever, right? Whatever. Is right. They come back, um, but they never go. MySpace, remember MySpace? Oh, yeah. like the thing. I, I don't see I got this. it at the tail end. I'm like, what is this? It was so slow, though. Yeah. Funky. I was like, ugh, why are people on here? Yeah. I don't but, say this with any superiority, but with my nature and my hearing loss, I'm actually introverted. Obviously, he's introverted, right? <laughs> well, the thing is, when I speak on a stage, I don't have to listen to anyone. Yeah. I just get to talk. But in a large party or soiree with pinkies up, right, I'll be in the corner just watching. Oh, really? Party. And... I'm all over that party. Yeah. That I'm but I've learned to be that way. And, yeah. And I've learned so I can network and mm -hmm. grow my business or, or connect with people. So, my nature... I didn't have an Instagram until after I retired from basketball. Mm. Because... I, I like my privacy and I didn't want to deal with all the haters and all the drama. And I let people, I have to go perform as a gladiator on stage. I don't need more projection onto me. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. Yeah. But sure. you had all my teammates, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them were just so obsessed about what are their followers saying. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, just, just play the damn game. You got a job to do. Oh, yeah. This doesn't pay your bills. This pays our bills right yeah. now. Yeah. And so it wasn't until after I retired, I'm like, oh, if I want to do this public speaking thing, I guess I have to get an Instagram. Like, oh, okay, let's do it. And so finding a way to do it, but again, to what we talked about, still being you and authentic, mm -hmm. find the right balance of marketing and being authentic. And like, this is still me, but it's not all of me. So people are still intrigued to know who is he really? Mm. and not always showing this perfect illusion of success and happiness either because again people are getting tired of that they want to know that you're real so it's okay when you're on social media like you know what hey this is what my recording studio looks like because that's actually inspiring because when people who follow you now and they're still following you and your program five years from now they get to see how far you've come mm -hmm. You should see, I started this with my phone and my friend that was yeah. like, you want to do this? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. My dad just had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you the story. He had a heart attack. And I actually I was dating this girl uh, right when he had a heart attack. It blew my mind. I'm not dating now, but I don't know what it was, but something about that relationship ignited my soul. Mm -hmm. She never said, are you, when are you going to do this or anything, right? It never was anything like that. But yeah. I was like... When am I going to do this? Yeah. Someday, I call it someday, never. never. Comes. And it was just, I call it someday yeah. means never. Yeah. So I'm like, I need to do it now. It's the hardest thing I can do right now. Yeah. My friend, uh, Rachel, thank you, Rachel, thank held you, Rachel. my hand, got on, uh, we did it on the phone, and that's how we started. Awesome. It was my dad's store. I was running. I didn't want to run, mm -hmm. but he was in the hospital. Right. All right. Yeah. And we started the show in, the, in one of the worst times I could. Yeah. And then we started doing it Facebook Live, and yeah. then I got a mic, and then I did this, and then I, came, the person that lived, this, my parents lived here for a few months, but you're, yeah. like you're saying, I got all excited to tell you, but mm -hmm. um, it's Perfect. been a you're process, sure. right? Process. Like those TVs I want to put up because I, it will add to it, mm -hmm. like something in the environment. Right? That's, but that's inspiring. It lets people know that you're real. And people have to understand, again, my success wasn't some natural overnight thing. Mm -hmm. 
I ret- again, I retired from basketball. I was going through a divorce. When I got my first big paid speaking gig of $8,000, I had $23 nice. $23 in my bank account. Wow. So people don't understand this, the life of an entrepreneur, if everyone could do it, they would. But it's not easy. No, it's not and easy. And achieving our goals and our dreams, again, it's not easy. It's if everyone could do it, they would. Yeah. It's hard. Mm-hmm. It takes work. And there's dignity in that work. Mm-hmm. And you know you're doing it with authenticity. And you're letting people know, hey, this is where I started. And I made a choice, a very difficult choice to pick up a phone and start recording when it looked like I had nothing going on with my life. Mm-hmm. That lets people know, you know what? It's not impossible. I can do it too. Whereas when you have the people that are just so superstar successful, but they don't show anyone what really happens behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. How do they get started? And so a lot of people are like, oh, those are emperors in the sun that I can never be. Mm-hmm. But actually you can't. But a lot of them don't want to share those stories because they think they have to be perfect. Well, some of it's too is that you can see podcasts and shows and all this stuff. We share the story. Yeah. Right? Of what it takes to get to where we were at. Right. And what's next. Yeah. But it's just it's just a story. It's like yeah. we, thirty seconds, two minutes, five mm-hmm. minutes. Yes. Like your TEDx, I'm sure it impacted pe- it impacted people and that was your point. Right. But if they don't give that impact, they didn't live the five years. No. Like struggling or yes. or exactly. putting their drape up or mm-hmm. talking on the phone or yes. whatever it was while my dad was in the hospital and this girl disappeared, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's why I was like, oh, yes. I've heard that that's yes. happened so many times, right. you know. But it's uh, they don't feel it. They yes. didn't live it. Yes. So it's, it's just it's just words to them. Yes, you have to let people know that you're human and that you have paid a price mm-hmm. to get to where you are. You can't just be in a talking head spouting out wise nuggets. You have to let people know, again, you get a price. By letting people know, this is you accepting your reality. This is where I'm at. This is my life. Watch me go on this journey. And watch me keep my integrity intact along the way. Mm-hmm. And that will inspire you. Great. Thank you so Thank much you. for being on this yeah. show and hanging in there for another, another no, show. I mean, Part two. This is great. Yeah, I appreciate it. Lance, if people want to work with you, how do they reach you? I'll go to my website, lanceallred 41com Lance, what's that? LanceAllred41. LanceAllred41.com. Or at Instagram, at LanceAllred41, the number 41 on both. I don't spell it out. LanceAllred, A-L-L-R-E-D, LanceAllred41.com. And um, that's the thing is we find... The MBA and those illusions, they didn't make me happy. Where I find my happiness is knowing that I, even just for a day, made someone else's life just a little bit easier. And that's what we love to do. And this is why I do what I do. So thank you for trusting me to be on the show and yeah, connect you. with your audience. And it's been great. Thank you. Thank you guys for watching and listening to the All to Perform show, the show about performing your best. Try to say that fast three times. Well, it's perform show, show about performing your best. Um, and business and life. And tomorrow we have a very special guest, Sylvia Nebley. She'll be talking about grieve globally um, and acting locally with Sylvia Nebley. So tune in, listen, and we'll see you tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Thank you, guys. And then I have to end the episode. We're still on. But officially we're done. See you later.